uh, thank you, Dr. Fukuyama, for this uh, very interesting uh, expose. Uh, I sort of will take the advantage of being the chairman to ask my first question and then leave it immediately to the rest of the, the room. But uh, I, wanted, I wanted to come back to Denmark uh, as a concept, not necessarily as, a, as in a real country, but uh, what, you, what you basically were saying is the, the ideal that we have in, in, in front of us is a, is a, a state uh, where you find the balance between the three elements that you were talking about, accountability, uh, rule of law, and uh, the, a, a modern state. Um, and we see the revolution in the Arab states, we see shocks in Turkey, Brazil, but then you wonder, are there ways of uh, getting to that ideal Denmark? Are there any Danish in the room? No. Uh, yeah, to the ideal of Denmark, we can now talk about a theoretical concept. Uh, the how do you get there in a sort of a gradual way, in, in a, in a well-managed way, in, an, in, a, in a way that doesn't require thousands of people to be killed in revolution? Uh, well, that's a good question, and I think <laughs> part of the reason I wrote this book is that there's a failure of people that live in countries like Denmark to realize how long and painful that modernization process was. Uh, and therefore, it's kind of a plea that you have to be a little bit patient You know, when you have a revolution in Egypt or Tunisia, and it turns out that three years down the road you don't have a functioning Denmark-like political system, and people are saying, well, what's wrong with these people? You know, Why don't they look more like Denmark? Uh, I, I just think that that just shows a great ignorance of, of the difficulty of, of doing things like that. So I think that there is a path towards modernization, but in many cases it had to be sequenced. Uh, you don't build all of these institutions simultaneously. You think about a country like Libya right now. It doesn't have any of them. It doesn't have a state, it doesn't have rule of law, and it doesn't, maybe it has a little bit of democratic accountability, but not very much, and so their task is actually to build all three of them simultaneously in very, very chaotic conditions, mm -hmm. and that's really, really hard. Uh, so I think that we have to understand that you gotta sometimes do one thing first and then another thing, and you know, sometimes the changes can take place over you know, a generation. Uh, however, not everybody has to take as long as Denmark did, because basically we have globalization. You know, Singapore, modernized, it, it took its own traditions and it borrowed some ideas from other parts of the world in a way that wouldn't have been possible a hundred years ago. So I do think that there are certain advantages that the modern world has in providing ideas, human capital, physical capital, you know, uh, that can speed up this process enorm enormously, but we still have to recognize it's, it's a slow and painful process. Hello, yes, I'm David Evans, I'm uh, from UBS. I'm also a board member of the Lien Center for Social Innovation here at uh, SMU. Um, rather than history, I'd like to ask you a question about historians and what you see their role in, in uh, creating uh, a, a modern state. Because I was, while you were talking, I was wondering about the host really the strong hostility that you, down the ages in China that you have heard from Confucians uh, with regard to the legalist state or, and Li Si and the first emperor and everything that you, you seem to be somewhat um, supportive of. And I just wonder whether, whether historians um, sometimes are captured by the elites as well and what your view on that was. Well, there's several different issues bound up there. So you know, the kind of state that emerged in the Han Dynasty was actually an amalgamation of both the Confucian and the legalist positions. Although the legalists officially lost, they actually got a lot of their views adopted by that Chinese state, uh, even though they didn't get, uh, you know, I think adequate recognition for it. And the Chinese tradition ever since then, I think, has been an amalgam. Now, do historians get used to rewrite history? Of course they do in China as well as everywhere else, uh, an issue that I take up at much greater length in, in the second volume than in the first is actually the fact that 
in a certain way, this rewriting of history is ne necessary for the creation of national identity. Uh, I do not believe that you can have a modern state without an overarching sense of community among the people that live in that state. Unfortunately, a lot of that comes out of oftentimes a very violent and sometimes quite intolerant and aggressive process, but it also does require creation of something like a common culture and common sense of belonging. And if you look at places where that's happened, uh, it is through the deliberate use of history or sometimes the misuse of history. But in some cases that actually has benign effects because communities need their founding myths about where they came from and why they have something in common with each other. If they don't have that, then they're just a bunch of warring families or tribes or regions or, or ethnic groups. And so that process of the political use of history is actually omnipresent and, and you know, important in creating a political order. I have a question up there. Yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Fukuyama, uh, in 2012, you visited Myanmar, and I'm, I'm from Myanmar, and you uh, wrote an article about it, and in it you said, in too many recent attempted democratic transitions, pro-democracy forces have failed to make the shift from being social society activists to being organizers of political parties yes. that could contest elections. So I was wondering, uh, uh, I guess my question is a more specific question of what uh, Dr. Demir uh, asked just now. Uh, instead of just a general uh, overview of how these transitions happen, can you give more ex uh, uh, explicit examples of how, <laughs> in a country like yes. Myanmar right now, this kind of thing can happen? Yes, so, no, definitely. And, and in fact, if you look at the current issue of the Journal of Democracy, I'm, uh, there's a transcript of a long panel discussion we had in Washington that deals exactly with this point. So, in my view, uh, there has been at least coming out of the United States, too much emphasis on that initial transition away from an authoritarian government to a democratic one, and not enough attention in the first instance to building political parties that can contest elections and actually come to power. That's the problem that happened in Egypt after the overthrow of Mubarak. But then beyond that, there is a failure to look hard at, at what it would mean to govern. So I would say that with Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, you know, she's got a pretty good chance of becoming the next elected president of Burma. She better have a technocratic body of economic advisors and a program that is well thought out, ready to go, and then some understanding of actually how to make a bureaucracy implement uh, a program. If she doesn't do this, then what's going to happen is going to be something very similar to what happened in Ukraine or a number of other countries where you didn't have this kind of follow through, that first democratic elected government is going to be feckless, doesn't have good policies, it, it ends up being corrupt, it delegitimates itself as a result, and then, you know, the authoritarians are back in power. So that's the, that's the advice I was trying to give. The, 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 Initial democratic breakthrough is only the beginning of the story. If you don't know how to govern, you're not going to consolidate the democracy. I have to say that she was sitting here in uh, your seat uh, five months ago, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then she got a similar question. She says, rule of law, rule of law. Yeah. Well, rule of law is part of it, but governing is, is not just the rule of law. And, and, and furthermore, everybody says rule of law, and almost no one knows actually how to implement this. Uh. <laughs> Okay, I have a question here. Thank you. Uh, hello, Dr. Fukuyaba. I'm uh, Fadi Huang from uh, School of Economics in SMU. I'm also doing similar research on the political economy. So I have several questions to ask you. First, uh, you said it's the model of uh, political development and political decay. Is there any other uh, channel than the bloody conflict, like revolution or demonstration, uh, that can lead to political development? That's a first question. Another question yet is that in your model, uh, it's like a universal model uh, across the West and East. Is there a possibility to have different uh, models of political development? Third one is about China. Uh, how do you think uh, to get the well-balanced China uh, from a tyran uh, tyranny to a well-balanced, I don't know, accountable government? Okay, thanks. Let me start with the last question first. So I have a very definite view on, on what China ought to do. Uh, I think that a near-term transition to competitive democ 
democracy is not, is not a good idea in China. I mean, we have too much, too many cases where that process can go wrong in a country where you've had a very powerful dominant party. What I think China needs to do is implement its own constitution. It actually has a pretty good constitution if you simply take away the four guiding principles that put the Communist Party in charge of everything. So I think that China ought to develop the way Germany or any number of other European countries did in the 19th century, that it goes from being a unbalanced dictatorship to one that is increasingly guided by rules and by law, and in which the rulers learn that they have to operate under these rules. And then over time, with growth of the middle class and more demand for participation, then down the road you can think about competitive elections. But I wouldn't put that first. I would put the, the rule of law uh, uh, first. Uh, I'm sorry, this, the, the first question of was whether uh, in times of decay that whether the only solution or the only path oh, no, no. to revolution. Yeah. No, um, in times of decay, uh, I think, again, this is an issue I take up in the second volume at much greater length, but yeah, you can have peaceful reform as well. Uh, and uh, there are actually many examples of, of reversing decay. You know, one of these happened in the United States in the 1930s. Uh, you had the Great Depression that was brought about by high levels of economic inequality and the New Deal coalition mobilized large groups of people to create the basis of a modern American uh, welfare state and that all happened peacefully. So yes, there are ways of, of reversing decay. And is it a universal model? Was it oh question? yeah, and, and well, what I hope to say was that, I mean, I believe normatively that a balanced regime uh, is a universal aspiration, but clearly the way societies develop, you know, the sequencing in which these different institutions are put into place uh, makes them end up in very, very different uh, positions. And so uh, nobody gets to the same model. I mean, there isn't a single answer to the, the question, I think, of, of uh, good governance given these, these um, historical experiences. I'm going to take a question there first, and come uh, down again, and then go there. Uh, professor, I'm Henry Chen from uh, SMU, student. Now, I have two questions. The first is that uh, uh, the first question is uh, you, you have uh, three pillars of modern uh, political orders. Now, uh, it just happened in the Middle East. Now, you have Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq. That doesn't have these three things in place. They don't have a uh, rule of law. They don't have accountability. And they don't have a running state. So what is your conjecture about the future trajectory of this so-called failed state, in a way? And then the second question is that in Chinese history, the state imbued a lot of powers on the leaders, and the people always look for transformational type of leaders. Now, uh, if you look at the, the way that the new president, Xi Jinping, consolidate powers, is something that could be said unprecedented in history. In 15 months' time, he was able to, to practically consolidate the powers that take Mao and Deng decades to build up. So how do you look at the future trajectory under him? Thank you. Well, on the first question uh, about these failed states, I think that the actual record, it, it, it varies because some of the interventions have been you know, relatively good, so the Balkans were, were largely stabilized and so forth. Afghanistan hasn't had a strong centralized state really ever in its history, and I don't expect that it's going to after the NATO withdrawal, I think that'll be a fairly chaotic place you know, uh, for some time to come. And I think part of the message is that creating modern strong state institutions is historically one that you know, really takes a lot of time. And so I don't expect there to be, you know, I, th I think a lot of these countries are gonna be wards of the international system uh, for some time. Uh, whether Xi Jinping is going to be a transformational leader or not, we'll just have to see because He's promised a great deal, you know, he seems to be consolidating his position relatively quickly, but a lot of those promises were made by, you know, the last president in, in, in terms of the economic reform agenda, and they never really came about. So we'll just have to see whether, you know, th this, this story unfolds in that manner. Yeah. Okay, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am a student from Raffles Girls School. 
Um, thank you for a very enlightening talk just now. Uh, so just now you raised that um, med the middle classes in many different countries in the world are actually rising up and they have higher expectations, asking for more political recognition and so on. But, and in your book you also mentioned that while people often like underestimate the thymotic part in, in people's mind, they actually, uh, even if economics economy is doing well, they might still ask for other things. But this is something that I am very, uh, I'm still very puzzled because could material pursuit really overshadow this part to ask for political recognition? So, for example, in China, some youths may still like struggle within themselves whether to stand up for the victims of the uh, 1989 Tiananmen Square or actually they, uh, but in another, on another ha uh, hand, they have a lot to lose if they work in the State Department um, and everyone is so competitive to make a good living in this era. And then my second question is that, um, what if the country, not the whole country, is on par? So that you have a sc small group of people who really want for uh, want to uh, fight for these things, but a larger group. So if there will be democracy, the large electorate will still be relatively ignorant and unexposed to such ideas. So how is this going to like reach a compromise? Thank you. Well. Um so I said that the middle classes often play an important role in creating demand for political participation. Uh, <coughs> however, they don't always do that. I mean, th they act in their own self-interest. So I think if you look at Thailand right now, uh, you've got all these middle class uh, um, yellow shirts. It's the yellow shirts that are the pro-monarch, right? Okay, so you got all the the, the you know, the pro-monarchy yellow shirts that actually don't want democracy uh, because they don't want toxin and they don't want all the redistributive policies that, that he's pursued. And I think actually a lot of the Chinese middle class is in the same position. That I, and I've heard this from a lot of Chinese themselves. They say, if we had one man, one vote tomorrow, all of these peasants in the countryside are gonna demand redistribution and they're gonna use the ballot box to get it and you're gonna kill the goose that's been laying the golden egg, and they may be right in that. I mean, you could get a toxin-like outcome, which wouldn't be to anyone's benefit. And so I think in a lot of cases, the middle classes actually are not in favor of democracy. The European middle classes were not uniformly in, in favor of democracy in the 19th, uh, in the 19th century. Uh, I'm gonna limit the questions to one question per person from now on, right? Uh, Stefan German, World Vision International, and student on the Tri-Sector uh, Collaboration Master's Program. I would like to take it from the state level to the sort of global political order and looking at the future sort of mega trends and some of the future challenges in the global commons and global public goods. And how do you foresee this sort of global political order of the present with a fairly broken governance system and the future sort of uh, trends? Yes, well, that's why you're taking this course with uh, <laughs> Professor Perini is to get answers to all those questions. <laughs> um, you know, I, um, I've learned a lot, actually, from Ann Perini, and it, it seems to me that one of the, you know, one of the truths about the emerging global order is it's not going to come from any one place, that you have many overlapping and competitive global institutions arising spontaneously. Sometimes there are creations of the governments, sometimes there are creations of civil society, uh, you know, acting spontaneously. And I actually think that that's about as good as you're going to do. You know, that uh, what you need actually is an international system of, of global governance that's sufficiently diverse uh, and competitive that good ideas can rise to the top and that there can be some sort of interaction between alternative models uh, and this sort of thing. I think the, the one thing that I know is not going to work is any kind of centralized hierarchical attempt to create a state-like structure at a supranational level. It isn't working in the, in the EU. Uh, you know, it's gotten really stalled there. And Europe is the only place where it's got a remote chance of, of ever happening. Uh, up there, one question. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm from Anglo-Chinese Junior College, and I have a question um, for uh, Dr. Fukuyama. It is that um, 
since we have talked about there is there can be this ideal universal model, but different countries are in um, different political system dependent on its people, then is the view of having this um, idealistic and realistic universal model ever justified? Thank you. Um, so I don't think that there's a, I, I didn't say that there's a single universal model. I think that there's an aspiration and then there's some negative things that people don't like. So I don't think that people like highly unbalanced regimes. People don't like living under tyrannical dictatorships where the state has complete you know, uh, authority over their lives and they have no personal choice and so forth. On the other hand, people also don't like living in deadlocked, gridlocked, uh, indecisive, weak, chaotic uh, political uh, orders either. Right, and so I think we know that neither of those extremes is, is something, so people want something like balance. Uh, I didn't actually say that there's a single point of balance that's optimal. Uh, I think that different societies will pick you know, different combinations of these institutions. Uh, and so I think in any Chinese society, the preference is gonna be for a stronger state and a weaker, you know, of constraint of the state. I just think that that's probably uh, inevitable. But I do think that Chinese societies, as they modernize, are probably going to want to shift that balance away from, you know, an overwhelmingly strong state towards one that's just a little bit more uh, constrained. Similarly, in the United States, you will never, ever get Americans to believe even in a European type of state. I mean, they just don't, uh, they don't like the government. You know, it's just not, it's not part of their political culture. So you'll never get a, you know, a kind of German type bureaucracy created in the United States. But what you can have is more decisive government than what we have now, right? So I'm not saying that there's a single template that's gonna work for all societies. All societies have to, you know, deal with their own traditions. But I do think that there are certain kind of universal aspirations for both, uh, you know, governments that can deliver services, but, but governments that are also, you know, constrained and accountable. And I, I think, you know, the mixture is, 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 is um, you know, pretty wide. I mean, the desire for some, some mixture of that is, is pretty widespread. Thank you for your answer. I'll take the first, the gentleman upstairs there, because you have been <coughs> waiting longer than the two ladies here in front. Okay, uh, thanks, Prof. Uh, my name is Walid, and I'm from, I'm a graduate student from National University of Singapore. Uh, and I'm just a bit confused as to what your argument is, and perhaps my question is just to reiterate uh, the chairman's first question. So what exactly, and I think you already answered that just, just before, that there is no ideal, ideal sort of solution, right? Um, so maybe just, uh, I, I'll, I'll go through your argument and then maybe you can tell me whether I got it right or not. So you are saying that uh, a strong, semi-strong state or strong state is important right in the aftermath of uh, democratization. For example, transition, uh, similar to a Huntingtonian argument. Uh, and then you are also saying that institutions will take a long period of time to form, similar to Putnam, for example. Uh, but then on the other hand, you say that Aung San Suu Kyi can do this, this, this to get certain effect. Where is the role of that long process of institution, to, how, to what extent does it matter? And if, it really, if that is really true, can agents ever change or reverse the effect of institution? And to what extent and when will that happen? It seems all very fuzzy to me at, the, at this point. Um, no, those are all reasonable, uh, these are all reasonable questions. So, um, you know, I, I guess the only, when I talk about the difficulty and the length of time to form institutions, you know, it's just a plea for kind of understanding that you don't get to Denmark, you know, overnight. And, and I think that if you're in a position of someone like Aung San Suu Kyi, or, you know, let's say the U Ukrainian opposition comes to power and, and uh, Mr. Yanukovych, you know, leaves, uh, and, and you got a new orange revolution, uh, you got to think very carefully about sequencing you got to say, what are the requirements of political order? And I agree with Huntington that in a certain sense, you, unless you have order in the first place, you can't have democracy or a lot of other good things. And so you got to get that state part of it 
uh, going. And then you got to think about what are your requirements for actually having a state? How do you run a bureaucracy? How do you retreat to it? What policies uh, do you implement? And sometimes you're not going to be able to do all of that at once. And so that's where the time element uh, comes in. But I don't have a universal answer to how any one of these leaders ought to behave because that depends heavily on the specific context, historical experience you know, that, that they face. And so in some sense, only they can really chart out a strategic course you know, to, to down the road get to you know, where I think they'd like to end up. I'm going to take the four questions in one go and then see perhaps uh, we can uh, answer it. Uh, okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Fukuyama. So uh, I'd just like to pick up on something that was briefly mentioned. So uh, Dr. Fukuyama mentioned something about how globalization and the modernized world actually benefits or speeds up the evolution of political order. But I'd just like to ask whether the idea of globalization, and specifically social media, actually makes people more rash, more violent, and perhaps resort to more violent and non-peaceful manner to progress the political order, or does it actually speed up progress and evolution of political order? So it's really about, because I'm not very really clear about how like social media and globalization would really affect the different aspects of political order in terms of the rule of law and democracy, etc. Yeah, thank you. The role of social media, yeah. Uh, good, good evening, my name is Ying Wei and I'm from Anderson Junior College. Uh, firstly, I want to thank uh, Mr. Fukuyama for uh, giving this lecture and um, as you mentioned just now, the change is going on, and I think uh, it is a true reason that the world now is undergoing globalization and a lot of changes are going on. And um, uh, gradually we have discovered that democratic, Western democratic ideals alone cannot sustain us as it is generating a lot of new problems while exacerbating the exi existing old problems. So as you mentioned, uh, a lot of uh, you mentioned a lot about Chinese history just now. I wish to uh, bring up one point. Uh, it is during Qing Han Dynasty in China, uh, actually a group of Chinese philosophers came up with many political ideals and uh, the, the most prominent figure of them would be Confucius uh, with his Confucianism. So do you actually um, appreciate these oriental political I ideologies and do you think they are the right solution to the world's in entrenched problems and do you think they are still relevant today? Thank you. Of Confucianism and uh, state building probably, yeah. Thank you. Can I take the other question there and then I'll come here? Hi, uh, my name is David. I'm from Deutsche Bank but I'm here in my private capacity. I've got a question about uh, the development of institutions. All of your examples discussed endogenous development of institutions. Um, I wonder whether you think they can be imposed exogenously by an occupier, a, c a colonial force, or an otherwise interested party. And last question. Um, hi, I'm a student from Raffles Girls School, and I'm also very curious about how um, does globalization, the exchange of information, play a role in um, the change of political order, because with globalization, we are continued to, in to be inspired by new political ideas, and how does it, like, um, eventually does it help to strengthen demo democratic system, or it will play a threat to the democratic system? Yeah, the thanks. The role of globalization, the role okay. of inter internet and yeah, social okay. media, can it be imposed, and what about Confucianism? Confucianism? Okay, so with regard to social media, I think it's pretty clear that it's very good for mobilizing people. Uh, it's less good for building institutions. Uh, and I think that was the experience in the Arab Spring that, you know, you can create a flash mob using Twitter and Facebook, but, you know, if you then want to contest an election and if you then want to govern, it's not so useful. Uh, but the, in general, I think it is a democratizing uh, force to the extent that information is power and it's just easier to get information now. So I think in that respect, it's it's overall a positive thing for democracy. On the subject, I didn't talk about Confucianism explicitly, but in my view, it's a very important doctrine because if you think about how authoritarianism differs in East Asia, in you know, Japan at a certain period, in Korea, in Taiwan, Singapore, and in China itself, you, this is the only part of the world where you've had so-called developmental states in which you've had authoritarian rulers that weren't just predatory, that had a 
sense that the society as a whole, you know, that they were accountable to the society as a whole. And I think that this comes out of Confucianism because it's a moral doctrine that teaches <coughs> rulers responsibility, you know, benevolence and, 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 and the sense of responsibility. And that's why I think you have this clustering of developmental states in East Asia and not in Sub-Saharan Africa, not in you know, the Middle East, not in other, uh, not in other uh, parts of the world. Uh, can uh, oh the yeah, institution so be imposed? Okay, well, so you're going to have to buy volume two because <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the longest section of volume two is basically, it's, it's your question. Uh, can foreigners impose institutions? Uh, my answer to that is if they occupy lightly settled territories and kill off all the inhabitants, then yes, they can impose their own institutions. And that's what happened in the United States, Australia, Canada, you know, South Africa, so forth. And um, globalization uh, really yeah. helps. <laughs> uh, short of that, uh, you know, it's a very complicated issue because, and, and one of the, I think, unfortunate impacts of Western colonialism was that it was sufficient to undermine traditional institutions but it wasn't strong enough to actually implant modern ones. And that, I think, is the problem of sub-Saharan Africa, that the impact of colonialism was really to wipe away the legitimacy of all of the traditional ruling African institutions, but they didn't invest enough to actually create real ones, except in South Africa, where there were, you know, where there were settlers. And that's, that's really the problem of Africa. Uh, globalization, is it good or bad for democracy? It's hard to know. <laughs> Uh, you know, globalization just means that ideas, people, everything travel across borders. They can be good ideas and they can be bad ideas. And I think, uh, in a sense, it's just like technology. Is technology good or bad for democracy? Well, yes and no. You know, they can be used by authoritarians and they can be used by Democrats. And I don't know that there's a consistent, you know, impact uh, uh, one way or the other. Certainly in the 19... Uh, 80s and 90s, globalization was a big factor in the global spread of democracy. But we could be going into a reverse, reversal of that trend in which globalization will spread different kinds of ideas. So. Last question from my side. Is the US in decay? Uh, no, I, that's the argument I make in volume two, which is that I don't, you know, I don't think America as a society is in decay because the strongest part of America was never its government. It was mm -hmm. always the private sector, very dynamic society, and I think America is pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, shale gas revolution, all this stuff going on. Are American political institutions decay? Yes. Thank you. I think that the applause speaks for itself, but I would like to thank uh, Dr. Fukuyama about, for first of all, the clarity of uh, the lecture, uh, the systematic uh, way to, uh, to approach the topic, the candidness with which you answered the questions, and I'm sure we are all looking forward to the second volume. I think you have solved a few ones here today. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.